Good morning. It's great, uh, great to be together. I know uh, we had those like 30 minutes of fall. Uh, now it's like July again, uh, isn't it? It's like every year we, we fall in it. Oh, it's gonna be so crisp and nice, and then it's like, ugh. But uh, so here we are. Um, we are in, um, <clears throat> you know, sort of can number two. We're talking about this idea of reach and what that means. And it's not about sort of building attendance or building a church or, you know, get it growing bigger. Uh, it really reaches about um, what we're willing to care about. It's a, it me- it's a measure of our heart. And so we've been using these three ideas, these three cans that I mentioned a couple weeks ago of care, connect, and goodness. And so we're opening up uh, this sort of second can of connection over the next um, few weeks together. And when we talk about connection, I'm talking about uh, certainly the idea that we, you and I, connect um, in particular ways, but that um, we connect uh, what happens between us. And part of the way we think about this is the way we relate to one another. Relationships are essentially the way in which we see ourselves as connected to each other. And it all is about this sort of space in between here. It's what it is we are willing to gather around, what it is that we are willing to, um, <clears throat> to establish as the, the reason for um, us to be connected to one another, how we see ourselves as related or connected to, t- to each other. The definition that we're using for connection is pretty specific. We're going to unpack this again over the next uh, few weeks together. That connection is to exchange life. It's, it's not just, it's, it's to exchange life with one another uh, so that we trust one another enough to live safely. I think we'll put that definition up on the screen so you can see it. Um, the connection is to exchange life such that we trust each other enough to live safely within the care of a community. And it's really important because a lot of us don't have any place where we feel like we can let our guard down enough and still be known or still be cared for or still be considered in the way that we want to be considered. And so we end up with a lot of distance, a lot of pseudo connections, a lot of connections that are built around a lot of things that can't really support what we long for in these connections. And we've kind of used these these two questions, these considerations that I want for us, again, just to put up there, and we're going to come back to these at the end. And and as we think about what this means for us as a church, what you believe about your own faith and your own sort of view of the gospel and what you would consider yourself to be a part of his kingdom and his call on your life, and therein your responsibility or your willingness to participate in his church. As so when I think about this, and what we think about this, is that can we risk, can we risk becoming more authentic expressions of God's redemptive community in the world? Are we willing to do the kind of things that represent the way of Jesus, even if they don't line up with the ideologies that we happen to most align with in most of the rest of the way we operate? We're gonna see a really clear example of that this morning uh, from Paul's letter to Philemon. If you have your Bibles, it's in the very back, uh, right past the T's we talked about last week, First and Second Timothy and Titus and Thessalonians. And there's just one simple, it takes two minutes and 37 seconds to read the entire book of Philemon. It's literally one page. And it's a letter. It is a provocative letter. It is very controversial. And so we're going to look at this um, today. <clears throat> so the first consideration is, could we be willing to risk what would be required to live the way Jesus invites us to. And the second consideration is, could you, as a person, an individual, set yourself within a community to, or, or that looks more like what God intends for his world to look like? Would we be willing to connect with others uh, in this way? A few years ago, I learned this, uh, this idea in a very powerful um, <clears throat> way. But you can imagine a large gathering of humanity, just all sorts of humanity from all walks of life, rich, poor. Some are clean cut. Others are still holding on to the hairstyles of the bygone eras like the mullets and et cetera. Um, there are Democrats there. There are Republicans there. There are conservatives. There are liberals. liberals there are people who voted for Bush and Trump and 
Reagan, and there are people who voted for Biden and Obama and the Clintons, right? They're all there. There's a contingency who couldn't stand any of them and didn't vote for any of them. There are Carolina fans, there are Duke fans, there are dog people, there are cat people, there are Star Wars people and Star Trek people. There are people who use Apple and then all kinds of other people who we don't really know who they are, but Androids and other such stuff. You can sort of pick your division and they are all there in this one place. And they're all gathered and they're unified around a simple story of a small town girl living in her lonely world she took the midnight train going where? Going anywhere. Just a city boy born and raised in South Detroit. Right, you know what's happening. And all these people are gathered there, singing and participating, and all the things that divide them seem to pale in comparison to something more glorious. In case you are just have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the band Journey, and we were all there watching them, one of the, still one of the best concerts ever. But anyway, you get the idea. So we're all there. And this is what's really interesting. <clears throat> After the show, these same people who would likely argue each, with each other, these same people who are made up of people who drive correctly and people who drive like maniacs and don't let anybody out are all cooperating together to let people go in front of them and give their place in line. And just this whole thing is working in harmony as they all exit the stadium and our radios are blasting and we're still singing and enjoying what we just gathered around. And the principle is this, that what we gather, what human beings gather around has the capacity to frame the way in which they interact with each other. Consider this, the thing that makes, the thing that frames our connection has the absolute power to determine or shape how we interact with each other. It actually has the power to shape the way we experience the world in real time. It wasn't a mirage that people were kind to each other, people who don't agree with each other, people from all kinds of different walks of life are participating together in real time, in real ways. And I think ultimately, perhaps it even has a shape, a shaping effect on the world around us. I say this because people gather around all kinds of things and you know what this is like. It shapes the way you treat people. It shapes the way you think. When you gather around certain politics, it shapes what you think about people who don't see the way you see. When you gather, whatever you gather around, whatever is the central place of your connection will likely determine the way in which you're gonna interact and experience the world around you and ultimately, probably, shape the trajectory of the culture. And this isn't about sharing the same love for music or rooting for the same sports teams, but this is about a kind of community, one that models, one that models the renewal of all things the way that God has intended from the very beginning. And this this way of thinking often will undermine the status quo and it will disrupt your own sensibilities. Because all of us have perspectives and all of us have things that we have grown to believe that need to be shaped and reshaped by the way of Jesus. And if that is not true for you, more than likely you have formed God into your own image rather than the other way around. We we are all dealing with this and working on this. So you have in this little letter of Philemon, one of Paul's most radical letters, and we see how willing Paul was to take what he knew about the gospel and to just apply it to a scenario that he was dealing with in real time that, would, uh, that had all kinds of political volatility and social consequences and all the, the controversy in between. So this is a letter uh, to a man named Philemon. <clears throat> Very short letter. Paul was in jail writing this letter. And the letter is about essentially a guy named Onesimus who has befriended Paul in jail. So Paul's in jail. Somehow Onesimus comes to him. Paul considers him a brother. Paul considers him a friend. Paul, in fact, says, he is my heart. There's a deep love that Paul has for for Onesimus. The problem is Onesimus is actually a slave who belongs to Philemon, another brother of Paul's who lives back uh, near Colossae, probably. 
And so there's all this tension of what's going to happen because there are laws that govern. Now listen, I, I want to be really clear because Paul is, is, is going to let the tension that we feel, he's going to let it just sit there. Um, he's going to do all this. And, and he's, he's, he mentions, he talks about slavery. And I think we just all need to acknowledge, right, slavery is a horrendous institution. I recognize, you know, I've, I've been involved in con, uh, conversations around racial reconciliation in, in America and white supremacy and all those things for, for a decade. So I, I, I'm not trying to minimize this at all. I understand there are very real implications on how we go about these things. And usually what happens when you begin talking about something like this is the conversation sort of explodes in its scale. It sort of grows to say, oh, well, this is, this, this is you know, about the American institution. Or it grows and says, oh, no, this is about human trafficking. And it's still a big problem. And it just always grows and grows and grows. And we tend to scale problems in our culture here usually to garner support for some political position that we already hold, or we use it to leverage as a weapon to prove a point that we already believe. And what Paul gives us is a very personal letter. Paul doesn't scale this scenario to a crisis to make it sensational. He scales it to make it personal. And so what I want for us to do in this, in this sort of loaded letter I want for us to lean in and to see what God might want to say to us, what's available for us, and what God's Spirit might instruct us to do um, today. So this is a real-time letter dealing with a very real issue as he is about to send Onesimus, a runaway slave, back to the, uh, the owner, back to his owner, the one who had run away from. Now in Rome, people have this, you know, there's a lot of you know, talk about how being a slave in first century Rome was terrible. It was terrible. You, you had no status. You were considered property. There was no dignity. Or there, there, it, was, it was horrible. Um, there's archaeological finds that talk about that there, there were, if you ran away, you were branded often and you could be uh, severely punished and even killed. So this was, this was a very... Um, you know, the law was clearly on the side, and the Roman law was clearly on the side uh, that Onesimus should be punished for running away. And it even indicates like he might have done something to Philemon as he left, taken something or simply stolen um, a property by taking himself. That's what they would have considered. If you, if you ran away, you actually stole property from the owner. So all this is, all this is loaded, baked in this story. So Paul is going to write this letter back, and it begins, he says, hey, to the prisoner, um, I'm Paul, a prisoner of Jesus, uh, and Timothy's here with me, <clears throat> to Philemon, our dear friend, and he addresses this letter to Philemon and the church that is meeting in his house. So Philemon is probably a wealthy guy, uh, and, and because if you were, and again, this isn't an indictment or a, a commentary on a, a moral uh, justification. It's just that if you were wealthy in first century Rome, you more than likely owned slaves. So that was, that was what was happening. So he's, he's writing to Philemon and the church that meets in his house. And then this is just classic Paul. I always thank my God, verse four, as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all of his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. I wanna hold there real quick. Look at this again. Paul says, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing that we share for the faith of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So he's just very quick to affirm there's a lot of really good things happening. And then he goes on, and I love this. This is, this is, this is so classic Paul. Paul is like, I mean, he's like the man. Like he, people know who Paul is. He says, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Now, either this is the most passive aggressive thing you can imagine, <clears throat> or Paul is sort of setting up a different way to live. Because it's like one thing, right? When you're a parent, you, you say to your kids, you're like, I, I'm gonna make you do something. 
Like, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna make you go with me to this thing that we're doing for you. And then basically, you know what? I'm not. I'm not gonna make you go. Just as a decent human being, as someone who loves your parents, you should ought to want to do this, right? You ever done this to your kids? And you're just exhausted. You're not, you're not gonna command them. You're just like, you just should be better than this. And, and sometimes it's not even that passive aggressive. Sometimes you just genuinely know that it's in them. Sometimes you know that making them do something isn't going to produce what you want. And this is exactly the tension that Paul, he's, he know, Paul wrote a whole letter about why the law doesn't hold the kind of sway we need it to hold. That our hearts have to be changed. And this is exactly what he's modeling. I love the fact that Paul's willing to trust that somehow, some way, people would have an allegiance to Christ and a devotion to him that would actually shape the way in which they do things. And then he opens up uh, this can that he's going to begin talking about. And he says this, and he goes on and he basically says, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. Onesimus, my heart, and I appeal to you for my son. So he is saying, basically, me and Onesimus are like this. I know he has run away from you. I'm sending him back to you. And I'm sending him back. He's my very heart. I would like to keep him with me because he is very useful to me. But I'm gonna send him back for you because I don't wanna do anything without your consent. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pit anything against us. I'm sending him back to you. So this is loaded. So you can imagine Anisimus, I mean, uh, Philemon getting this letter because he's ticked. Now he knows that, that Paul is like harboring his runaway slave. And then Paul says this, and this is in verse uh, 15. We're gonna pick this up. Uh, perhaps the reason that he was separated from you so Paul, perhaps the reason that he's run away and he's with me, they separated from you for a little while, is that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Do you see what he's doing? He is completely turning upside down. The way in which people ought to think or normally think the status quo of how these issues are resolved. And so I want you to welcome him back, not as a slave, but as a brother, something far more. He is very dear to me, but he is even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. He has taken a relationship that is normally very clear in its legal status. This is property you are his master, and he has now said, there's something that binds us together that reframes how we're gonna operate and the kind of life we're going to experience together and the life we're gonna create in the world that God seems to be intending to do. <clears throat> and then he just ups the ante. Verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Because you know if Paul showed up, there'd be a party. If Paul's coming back from prison to see them in Colossae, there's gonna be a party. And he's like, I want you to welcome him just like you would welcome me. And then he says this, if he has done you any wrong or if he owes you anything, do what? Put it on my tab. We read this and, it, and it, it, we don't even, we, we, we can't hardly kind of imagine the controversy and the tension because you're, you're messing with the way systems work. Philemon has a way of life that has preserved, no matter how good he is to his slaves, this is still how things work. And now he's upsetting this. And then he says, not only that, but if he owes you anything, you credit it to me. Think about what Paul knew about the gospel. Paul knew when he wrote in 2 Corinthians, he's talking about reconciliation. He would say things like this. We no longer regard anyone according to the flesh, but rather if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. All things are, uh, old things are gone and all things have been made new. And he would say, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the very righteousness of God, that somehow the character that Jesus 
possesses gets transferred to me. And what is Paul saying? The character that I have, I'm giving to Onesimus. When Jesus says that I, I took the penalty of your sins, Paul is going, whatever debt he owes, you put this is He's just taking the literal gospel and he's saying, I'm gonna credit my reputation with you to him and I'm gonna take anything that he owes you and you just credit that back to me. This is the exchange. And he just models this. Now, what do you think Philemon does with this? He's like, dang, I thought this was clear. I thought this was clear. And what Paul just did is some kind of judo move that made everything muddy. Because he knows there's something else at stake here. See, here's what's really interesting. These these two verses, and it's it's really verse 6 and verse 17. I pray that your partnership, I pray that some some versions say, I pray that in sharing your faith. And then in verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, there's there's this tension of the way in which we see ourselves as connected to each other. I wanna look at this from a little bit different um, version in uh, it's, a, it's a little bit cleaner because I want you to see what Paul's talking about. This is in uh, verse six of the uh, New English translation. It's done um, just a very literal way and there's a lot of uh, nuance of language and this is a great translation. But he says this, I pray that the faith that you share with us may do what? The faith that you share with us may deepen your understanding of every blessing that belongs to you in Christ. This idea of partnership or sharing our faith is the word koinonia. It's a Greek word, koinonia. And it's often translated fellowship or sort of maybe more modernly community. And those are good translations, but it's not just about fellowship and us like getting along. It's really about this this cooperation and deep agreement and devotion and connectivity and interdependence of mutual benefit and mutual risk. Can we be willing to trust each other in this? This isn't theoretical. This is real life. It's fleshed out between Onesimus and Philemon. This is a shared faith. This is a kind of devotion that doesn't just connect us, but it deepens those connections. Imagine if Onesimus believes Jesus the way Paul does. And imagine if Philemon believes Jesus the way Paul does. You know what has to happen in this, right? In order for Onesimus to take, and more than likely, Timothy or or Epaphras, one of them took this letter back. So you can imagine Onesimus showing up with this letter. What has to happen? Paul has to trust that Onesimus isn't just playing him to get out of being Philemon's slave. Paul has to trust Onesimus. Onesimus has to trust Paul that he has the clout with Philemon. Philemon has to trust Paul that Paul is telling the truth about Onesimus. And then ultimately, Onesimus has to trust Philemon and Philemon has to trust Onesimus, right? Do you see this? The currency, right, the, 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 the only thing that allows the kind of exchange we're talking about is trust. That's it. And what, what seems to be happening here, and this is what I think is so powerful about this, that what, it, what this is about is not so much about the credibility of another person, although it is, please don't misunderstand me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a disclaimer in just a moment because I recognize There are people in this room and you have been manipulated and burned. You have lived in codependent relationships or some other kind of relationships where there was just chronic unhealth. And and so you don't trust or you won't trust and then you feel guilty that you don't trust and that person uses your guilt to keep you doing the same kind of patterns that have kept you. I know that happens. Also recognize that we live in a culture that is just steeped in distrust. 
But what God is doing, right, if, he, if, if what he's saying is that what we gather around not only has the capacity, not only has the capacity to shape the way we treat one another, but it also has the capacity to actually create the world in which we are going to live these pockets. Can you imagine that Rome didn't change a bit? The laws governing slavery, the laws governing runaway slaves did not change a bit. But in this place over here where God's kingdom holds authority, it was all different. Really, truly, actually different. The world in which they lived and experienced was actually different because people were willing to live according to a different rule. That's the picture that I'm trying to, does that make sense? Oh, I'm trying to like get this so clear. I want, you, I want us to get this. Because what he's saying is, if we partner together, it's, it's your shared devotion and my shared devotion. It's our shared devotion to Jesus that actually deepens us into the kind of wholeness that we long for. To become whole, right, is the way in which we become one. To, for us to learn how to gather and we have to share. It, it, there doesn't, it's not you getting yourself right, me getting ourselves right, and then we meet in the middle. It's actually participating together. If we are partnering, if we are experiencing koinonia, mutual risk, mutual responsibility. I begin to think about this, and if, if this is true, this is profound for us as human beings and particularly hopeful for the church, that all of us long to be one, right? You see people with the bumper stickers on the back of their car, it says coexist, right? You've seen this and it's got all the, the crescent and the cross, it's got all the religions and it's like, coexist. you've seen this stickers? And <clears throat> what that is, is it is God's vision for humanity on our terms. And what, what is, seems to be true is that whatever, you can't gather around 35 things and you certainly can't gather around lesser things. Because at some point, journey's awesome until Carolina's number one in basketball. <laughs> right? And then don't stop believing ain't enough to get me to be kind to you. Or vice versa. At some point, there has to be something that is so worthy of our allegiance, so worthy of our lives, that everything else fails in comparison. And what Jesus said was, I'm it. I'm it. Humanity will only experience the oneness that we long for within the wholeness that we have been made for. If I'm right, that you will never find meaning and purpose, you've been made by God and for God. If you've been made by him and for him, then it stands to reason that you will not find meaning or purpose apart from him. And we as humans will not find anything sufficient enough to gather around that will do what we want. The wholeness, the oneness that you and I all, can't we all just get on? The oneness that we all long for will only be realized in the wholeness that you've been made for. And that is your devotion to Jesus. In order for us to deepen, you must be willing to share. There just isn't any other way. It's not how we've been designed. It's not how God has designed this to work. This foundation is partnership. It's you and it's me and it's us. It's a connection that pulls us into something deeper. And what it actually says is that when we share our faith, we are actually drawn in deeper to the work, to the way, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somehow, I believe what Paul was doing is when they 
actually shared this together and experiences, what they learned is they learned something adept to what kind of integrity and wholeness God was longing to do in their lives. It's something that gets into our bones. It seeps deep in to who we are. So what are we willing to gather? And what are you willing to connect around? Our devotion to Jesus, his lordship, provides the only sufficient foundation for us to live the way we've been created to live. I want to say that one more time. Our devotion to Jesus Christ, his lordship, his authority, his rule, provides the only sufficient foundation for us to live in the way that we've been created to live. And you'll only experience the oneness, right, that you long for. You'll only experience the intimacy with other people, the connectivity to other people, as your own personal devotion to Jesus grows. I want to read this, and this will be on the screen. If we are followers of Christ, if we are truly followers of Christ, all of our differences must be placed in subjection to his rule over us. Some of those differences are intended by God. Others may be distortions of his design. But either way, either way, our differences can never be allowed to rise above the wholeness that comes from our shared devotion to Jesus. What makes me excited about this is when I think about Philemon, and we don't even know how it turned out. We just don't know. That's the letter we get. I assume that because the letter is around and stayed, something beautiful must have happened with Onesimus and Philemon and that little group in Colossae. Can you imagine the stories that were being told? Can you imagine the tension of Onesimus coming back? Man, I thought Philemon was going to kill me, and he didn't, and... This is what happened. And it's not just the story, but what everybody in that circle actually experiences about the world around them. There's a little pocket that isn't subjected to the nuttiness and the futility that is so prevalent in the culture. And what what continues to give me more and more hope for the church is that if we could become a place Because you don't need to figure out if you can trust the people that you don't trust on your own. You need a place where things were different, were really and truly different, where we operated differently. And that we begin to experience that in the context of these pockets of connections that we make and that all of a sudden we begin to experience the world a little bit differently than the nuttiness and the chaos that exists everywhere else. I've been working a lot of settings over the last few months pretty intensely, and, and the lunacy of how systems work is maddening. Do y'all, y'all know that? And I just keep going, God, could we be different? Could we be different? And then in our difference, you force everybody else to deal with what is distinct about the way in which they've actually been created to live. Everybody knows that this other way ain't working. And what I think we're looking for is a place or a way where we share this and begin to see something and experience something different that makes us hunger and thirst for more and more and more of that. That's that's what I I think um, can happen. So, that's what I think is at stake. So back to the two questions. Could we risk? Could we risk becoming a more authentic expression of people who lived under the rule of God's love? Could we? And I know it's a big ask. But could you 
consider setting yourself in a place that looks more and more like this kind of rule. Because it might be for a few minutes here and there. We might experience it just for a moment, then it recoils back to the way it was. Maybe experience it again, and before long, maybe it becomes more and more of the culture. And then it becomes like a little bit of yeast that's in a dough that just sort of moves through and moves through and moves through until, lo and behold, right, things become different. What are we willing to gather? And this is why we keep talking about Jesus being our king, our devotion to Jesus and his lordship provides us the only foundation. So what I want you to do out of here, I want you to test your own devotion to him. Not in a second guessing way, but just where is it that he needs sway and authority in your life? And are you willing to yield it to him? And then, Find someone that you trust. And if you don't have anyone in your life you trust, reach out to us. We would be honored to be a people that you learned to trust again with. We can help you. Reach out to someone you trust and then begin to share that devotion. You know why? Because it is in that shared devotion that you will begin to deepen the thing that you actually long for. We're made for. And then we get to experience the thing that we have been created for. All right? Father, what an unbelievable uh, vision for <clears throat> what the gospel does for us, for me. Father, we're so used to coming and applying and going, okay, well, we're going to do this about what we heard. Rather, I ask that you would just really challenge us. You would speak to us. You would um, remind us, deepen us, give us the courage to foster the kind of connections where we learn to trust more and more and more and more. And that as we do, we would deepen in what it is that you are doing, not only in our lives, but through our lives for the sake of this world that you long to renew and to redeem. So I thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for the extraordinary beauty of the gospel that compels us and the power of your love sufficient to rule over every circumstance that we face. Father, would our hearts be fully devoted to you as our king. And so, Father, we ask these in the name of your son, Jesus, who sits on that throne. And so every knee bows and every tongue confesses. God, would we give our allegiance to you in each moment that you've entrusted to us. And I pray this in his name. Amen.